Well, ciao, buona sera, everyone. Good evening, clinicians from wherever you may be joining us. Um, before we kick off our study club this evening, I just wanted to send uh, happy holidays from everyone at UNIVET, including myself, and welcome you to our study club series led by the legendary Richard Stevenson III. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to mention that at the end of the webinar, there's going to be a course evaluation, and that's required for you to obtain your CE. Okay, so make sure you stay to the end. It's going to be um, done via QR code. And if you need the link, we can post it into the chat for you as well. Dr. Stevenson is going into the unique study format. Before we get started, I wanted to highlight a few important products that help put the webinar together and share a brief biography of Dr. Stevenson. I also wanted to mention that Dr. Stevenson has been kind enough and gracious enough to do this webinar um, pro bono. So thank you to Dr. Stevenson. We, we really appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to learn from you. So just quick bio here. I'm sorry, quick uh, review of some of some products I wanted to share with you. So if, if you haven't heard of Univet before, or maybe you're unfamiliar with our products, we are known for having superior, crisp, clear, phenomenal optics. But in addition, we make some beautiful frames. So what you see here is our one frame. And this coating on the frame, it's the same coating that's on a Ferrari engine. So if you're thinking, ah, oh, you know, I've seen this material somewhere, you gotta go look at the Ferrari in your garage, pop the hood open. It's gonna look exactly the same. I absolutely love this frame. It has incredible ergonomics as well. Uh, another product of ours that I just wanted to highlight is our ETIF frame. Okay, this is a brushed stainless steel with polished nylon. Very aesthetic, beautiful frame, a ton of room to look over the top of the carry lens so you can talk to your patient and check your work. It's definitely one of our more popular frames, especially for those out you, for those of you out there in New York. We also make overloop face shields, uh, two different styles, whether you have a prismatic or Galilean loop, um, they're gonna fit very comfortably and make sure that your optics fit within the, the range of the lens and um, very, very comfortable products. Also just wanted to mention that we do way more than, than loops. You know, we have a, a safety eyewear line from an economy product all the way through to a premium line. This is one of my, uh, my favorite safety glasses we make. It's very, very comfortable. And we have a full line of laser eyewear. So whether you're using soft tissue or hard tissue lasers, uh, whether it's for the patient, for the assistant or for yourself, we have laser eyewear that you can order from us specific for your wavelength. We also make these beautiful and simple laser inserts that simply just slide right behind your glasses to make sure that you have you know, your optics while you're doing your laser dentistry or laser hygiene. And I wanna take a moment just to show you this quick video from this amazing 4K digital loop mounting camera we have called the ProCam. Check this out. So this is our 4K digital camera. Oh, is it still on the screen? Yep, there we go. Something I love about this camera is that it's super tiny. It's gonna shoot in 4K and it's incredibly lightweight. And this is the kind of resolution we're talking about that's gonna help you take your documentation or your content creation to the absolute peak level of, of technology that's available. Um, this is shot with the 15 millimeter loop mounted lens, but there's also a 16 as well. I'm trying to skip ahead here. There we go. And a 35. So if this is something that's interesting to you, if, if you're um, a content creator or your document or you want to take education to another level, maybe at your institute or your school, reach out to us in the chat box or email us and we would love to bring this to your school, your residency program or your private practice and show you what it can do for you. So that being said, I just wanted to again, just go over a brief introduction and bio for Dr. Stevenson. So Dr. Stevenson earned his degree uh, at UCLA in 1986 after practicing general dentistry for 17 years, I'm sorry, seven years in Laguna Niguel he accepted a full-time teaching position at UCLA in 1993, where he served as a chair of the section of the restorative dentistry for 17 years. 
He's published dozens of articles on dental materials, the principles of evidence-based dentistry, and restorative techniques. Uh, he's written several textbook chapters and syllabi. He's the inventor of several unique dental instruments, which are used in dental education and clinical practice. Dr. Stevenson is a board certified, uh, he's, sorry, he's board certified in operative dentistry and he practices dentistry in San Dimas, California with the focus on microscope implant and aesthetic dentistry. Although he retired from UCLA in 2018 as professor emeritus of clinical dentistry, he says that he's just getting started. After leaving UCLA, he founded Stevenson Dental Solutions, a teaching institute dedicated to hands-on training where he serves as the director of education. Recently, he established a nonprofit corporation investigating best practices in dentistry and innovative methods of delivering quality care and pre professional education to communities the most in California with his wife, Savi. Dr. Stevenson, good evening. Thank you for joining us. Great. Well, thank you, Devin. Uh, and thank you, Carla, for all the back office support. I'm really happy to be here with everybody. And I'm particularly interested in seeing how many of you make it uh, through the five parts. You're going to have to be a person of dedication a driven individual to stay with me for 10 hours. But I, I have some confidence you can do it, okay? <laughs> it's it's going to be intense. Uh, this series uh, would not be possible without uh, my appreciation and support from uh, Univet, uh, Univet Optics. I have their, uh, their loops. Uh, I actually have a collection of about 11 pairs of loops. And uh, currently 20% of my loop collection is Univet, and I, I hope to see that grow. I also have that 4K camera, which is amazing. We use it in our courses all the time for clinical uh, dentistry, particularly uh, things like implant dentistry. It's, it's amazing. We can actually have it catapult, you know, cantilever over the patient in a very small little uh, wire, uh, kind of like a, a what would you call that? Like a boom or something? And we call it a gooseneck, but yeah, gooseneck, right. You can put it right next to the patient, and they don't really get freaked out by it. So it's, it's kind of nice. Um, let's see. And uh, probably a lot of you know me through uh, my YouTube channel, uh, and we can. Um, I'll talk about that just a little bit, but I wanted to go over. Uh, you know what? Let me get my first slide up, and I'll start talking. How's that sound? Okay, let's rock and roll. And I want to make sure I am sharing, right? So, okay. Okay, Dr. S. Am I sharing? You can all see my slide. And there it is. It says Ceramic Restorations, an in-depth five-part series that is uh, co-sponsored by Stevenson Dental Solutions and Univet Optical Technologies. And like, like Devin said, I'm not receiving any honorarium for this. Um, and I have never made that uh, a major priority for me. Uh, I've always made just sharing knowledge and uh, I get excited about dentistry. Uh, I feel that uh, it has rewarded me tremendously. And in return, I am going to continue to, to share what I know in, in our common pursuit of trying to be better, better versions of ourselves. Uh, let me briefly tell you what's going to happen in this five-part series. First, first part is we're going to talk about materials. We're going to talk a little bit about how do you save more tooth structure through an innovative technique. And then we're also going to get into the preparation designs for the, for the uh, ceramic preparations in the posterior. Uh, in part number two, which is going to be in January, we think it's going to be January 19th, but stand by. We figured that we're going to have about one of these every month or so. Uh, we'll be on impressions, immediate dentin sealing, adhesive dentistry as it relates to indirect, you know, restoration ceramics, and also, uh, you know, things like post-op sensitivity, troubleshooting, and, and issues of that kind. Part three is uh, pretty cool because we're going to go from the posterior to the anterior at that point, and we're going to focus on uh, ceramic veneer diagnosis. Uh, treatment planning, smile design, digital smile design, uh, mock-ups, and incorporating all of that into your approach towards veneer dentistry. Part four will be on veneer preparations and provisionals. And then part five will be on veneer delivery and occlusal analysis, which would include 
adjustments, specialized adjustments for full mouth rehabilitation cases, which a veneer case essentially is, and also polishing the ceramics to get it to, uh, to work and last longer. So uh, that is kind of an overview. One more thing I wanted to mention, and, and I'm thinking of a name, you know, Univet Stevenson Ceramic Study Club. I don't know, U-S-S-C-S-E, -S uh, too, many, too many S's and C's in there, I think. But anyway, we'll figure out something. And I think it'll be really great for all of you to hang in there and get 10 units here. Uh, you are going to learn basically uh, information that not would not easily be gained in one series you know this is this is you know a lot of my buddies will focus on just veneers or they'll have a whole spiel about immediate dent and ceiling or maybe biomimetic dentistry or something of that nature they'll focus in on something but we're going to give you a really broad overview and i would say that if you and and, and i will also provide to all the participants a pdf handout of every lecture Okay, so you don't have to sit there and take a bunch of notes unless that helps you. I will provide that to Devin and he will distribute those links through Dropbox. Um, and you're going to get approximately uh, 800 slides of information on ceramics based on uh, my 36 years in our in our wonderful profession. Okay, uh, we are also going to make this somewhat interactive and we'll do our best to answer questions along the way. And we're also going to talk about some cases. So if you have a case that you think would be interesting to share, it could be something simple like, hey, here's something I did and the patient's sensitive, what could I do? Or here's a situation, I don't know how to prepare these teeth, what would you recommend? Or uh, this person seems to have an unstable bite and yet they wanna proceed, how do I go about that? Any of those kinds of things uh, could be presented I will take your slides, I will present them, and then we'll make you a co-presenter and you can share a little bit about your case and then we can troubleshoot or we can discuss how that case maybe could be uh, looked at uh, from, from uh, my perspective and your perspective and everything that we know. Okay, so I thought that was kind of cool. I hope that that happens next session. So we're looking at January uh, 19th, I think it is, a Thursday. There'll always be a Thursday nine o'clock Eastern time, six o'clock Pacific, and uh, let's get started. All right. So um, I uh, am not a guy that takes money from corporations. Uh, I'm very strange like that. I don't, I don't think it's appropriate for me to be an objective scientist uh, and clinician if I am, uh, you know, getting the, um, the, the the juice from the companies and that's why i i told univet i i would like to do this but i will not get i will not take payment of any kind and so that's what what i'm what i'm all about i think it's important for you to know that uh, because i still consider myself an academic i am an emeritus professor for restorative dentistry at ucla and um i think it's i take it very seriously anyway there occasionally i'll get some uh, some items to evaluate and so i put those up there um, I don't uh, Photoshop images. I don't even have Photoshop. I I got it once. I don't know how to use it. I, it's, for me, it just was like, forget it. It's another language. I don't want to learn it. So everything you see is raw uh, dentistry with all the mistakes that you would expect to see on any normal human being, which I am a member of that group. I am a human and I make mistakes. We all make mistakes. Unfortunately, on Instagram, sometimes it looks like people never make mistakes. And that's not good. It's not good for your psyche. And it's not good for reality. Just because it looks beautiful doesn't mean it really is. A lot of the patients that you see on Instagram were treated over the course of an entire day with 500 photographs and several hours in Photoshop to get that one image looking good. Keep that in mind, folks. And don't feel bad about being uh, normal. Okay. It's good. All right. Uh, it, I do have Stevenson Dental Solutions. I would love to see anybody come. That's how you can, I can get paid is if you come see me, you know, uh, come take some courses. Uh, our courses are incredibly popular. They're always small. We take no more than 20 people. Most of our courses are right around, you know, 12, 13, 14 people. And um, they're just really fun. It's an intimate environment. Everyone gets over the shoulder training. They're about 80% hands-on. I mean, the worst thing about this seminar series, the worst thing is it's not hands-on. 
I'm used to hands-on. I'll talk for about 20, 30, 40 minutes. And then, man, we just dig in and we start doing the work. Um, but uh, we're really excited because our courses are, are word, the word is getting out and people are coming and we really appreciate you doing that. I know some of you have taken my courses. You're, you're at this webinar. I appreciate your support. And as I said, one of my, um, my, my, uh, loves is to give back to society. And I have uh, started a nonprofit and we are going to do some amazing things. We finally got federally, uh, we got approved just last week on all the final details. So we're good to go there. And I'm really excited about uh, incorporating research and helping people that are looking for a career come to dentistry. Because as you all know, we are suffering right now. It is really tough to find people that want to teach. It's really tough to find uh, auxiliaries and staff members to help support us. It's a tough time. So I want to see if I can't do something just a little bit to maybe uh, turn the corner on some of those issues that are affecting all of us. Um, there's my YouTube channel, by the way. It's at, um, they have a thing called a handle now, right? It's called at Stevenson Nail Solutions. Um, I don't know why they needed to do that. It could have just, you could have just put it in and Google it and you'd find it that way too, just as easily. But I have uh, uh, over a hundred videos up there and um, I really appreciate the support there too. All right. Um, one uh, dis uh, disclaimer here, there's a lot of information. So just understand that, you know, there are many ways to do things well, okay? So you may be in a dental, uh, in a pros program, maybe you're a prosthodontist or your faculty member and you teach at your school a little different technique, that's fantastic. Don't you agree that there are many ways to do things well? I mean, you could, you know, chefs, 10 chefs will create beautiful food, but they did it all differently. Um, we have different types of incredible cars. We have different artists. We have different musicians. And it doesn't need to be just one way. The key is that you are driven by the truth and by longevity and by excellence at every step of the way. And if that is at the core, it doesn't matter how you get there. It matters that you got there. Okay. So uh, keep that in mind. And uh, everything you learn here uh, should be tempered with what you have learned in the past. And you guys are intelligent. Let's uh, not do something silly, like jump into a veneer case after listening to the veneer lecture that is over your head. Okay, thank you, my mentors, Dr. Richard V. Tucker. Uh, he passed away about eight years ago and Dr. Warren Johnson, alive and well. Um, they introduced me to fine dentistry and they helped shape my hands. They really were truly exceptional in getting my hands to work properly. Thank you both very much. Dr. Uh, uh, Johnson, I get to see him every year in Chicago at the Academy of Operative Dentistry meeting. If you're looking for a meeting that is all about the guts and the meat of dentistry and no hype, you go to the Operative Dentistry meeting in Chicago in February. You go there every year. That is the finest meeting that I know of that has no hype. There's no commercialism, and yet it's very exciting, and it's a very inviting group. Uh, Devin goes to that meeting as a sponsor every year. He loves it. Uh, once you go, you keep coming back. So if you're interested in a great dental meeting that is absolutely worth it, you go during the coldest, most bitter week of the year in Chicago, and you will absolutely love it. So I welcome you to come to the Academy of Operative Dentistry Annual Meeting. You can join and come, and, and you don't even have to join. Come as a guest if you want, but join would be even better. And then a couple other mentors, John Coyce and Frank Spear. These are guys that are household names. I know them both. Uh, I know John quite a bit better because I've gone through his entire curriculum. Uh, I'm a graduate of the Coyce Institute, and I love this man. I love Frank Spear. He's probably the best one of the best uh, teachers that I've ever met in my life, uh, and that is of any subject. And they're both, th the thing that they have in common is they're, they, they're driven, passionate, excellence-oriented individuals. And so birds of a feather flock together, you know, and that's probably one of the reasons why you're here is that you want to do what I've done and I want to do what they did. And so we all just sort of are on the same path and it's very powerful and it's fun to be part of that, that jet stream of knowledge. Uh, some of you are at the bottom of this pyramid. And I like to think of this as sort of like the learning pyramid. At the very bottom, you have your D1, D2s. Maybe you haven't done any CE, although there are some of you in dental school in D1, D2s that are here with me tonight that are taking a CE course. Maybe you've taken many. You're amazing. That's incredible. You're already ahead of the game. 
by the time you get out of dental school, you're kind of at the top of that yellow level. And then probably after doing about a year or maybe uh, two to five years of CE in practice, you'll be above the purple, sort of like a purple belt in karate. Maybe you go into a PROS program and you get up to the level of the blue belt, or maybe you've you've taken a lot of CE, 100 per year or something like that for your whole life. You'll be kind of at that level. But then you can become a CE superstar. You can take CE courses that are hands-on. You can obtain fellowships. You can go to the Coy Center or Frank Spears classes. You can come to my courses, whatever. You can join a study club and become a member for 20 years. That's what SC20 means. And then you can be a green belt. And then finally, you can move your way up to brown belt and black belt by just continuing in that and then giving back. Essentially, the top two levels is about giving back to those who are trying to obtain the same level of knowledge. So um, welcome, no matter where you are in the pyramid, I welcome you to this presentation. And let's define something that I don't think anyone's ever re referred to it this way before, but I like this term a lot because, you know, all dentistry is aesthetic, de should be aesthetic dentistry. Wouldn't you agree that all dentistry, whether it's a cleaning, a denture, even an amalgam filling, okay, all dentistry should be aesthetic. In other words, we need to think about the preservation of the beauty of the teeth at all, at as much as we possibly can. We don't just simply cover something, we enhance it or we preserve it while making it look natural. That's aesthetics, that's incredible. And this is something that we can do with just about any restorative material if it's carefully thought out. Now, durability, that is something that very few patients actually ask about. And I found that my patients will oftentimes select a better choice when you tell them about the durability differences between one material choice or one restoration type and a different type of restoration. So the idea of combining longevity or durability with aesthetics uh, to me just is the ultimate approach towards dentistry. So I've, I've, I've coined this phrase, no one said it before. My passion as a practitioner is to provide my patients with aesthetic durability. Let's talk about a, some, uh, some failures. I love failures because failures will teach us about how we can be better at, you know, everything. Uh, if you understand the failure, we can understand maybe how we can prevent it in the future, right? So this is Angela, and Angela had an onlay that was done by a clinician that I happen to know, uh, to know actually, this clinician. And uh, this onlay preserved the mesial marginal ridge. And I, and I think that's admirable. You know, it, people, the, the, the clinician wanted to save some tooth structure. Great. Okay. Awesome. Um, but it didn't work. And so, you, you know, the patient would chew on this and she would feel pain. And the pain she felt was not tooth on tooth pain. It was the bolus of food was causing the pain. So you start thinking things like, oh, it must have been a crack. Um, and yet the tooth did not really respond to crack type pain. It wasn't cold sensitive. It didn't have the type of pain you would experience with a crack. Uh, a, you know, a tooth sleuth was used on each cusp tip. And yet it elicited no pain. But when you push the tooth sleuth right in the middle there, where you see a little brown spot, it felt pain. And I'm going to talk to you about why this happened and how it was corrected. This next patient is Sarah. And Sarah had these veneers about seven years ago. And when she came to the practice, she was like, I don't get it. What's happening? You know, I have recession and I have staining and I hate it. And I paid a fortune for these veneers. And the veneers themselves were actually quite lovely. Uh, they had beautiful translucency and lots of optical effects, and, and they looked really quite nice. And, and they actually, they fit really well. This was not bad dentistry overall. This was just someone who didn't understand a tip I am going to share with you in part five. I will share with you exactly why this happened and exactly how to prevent this in uh, part five of our series. This is Sean, and Sean had a couple of zirconia crowns placed. Now, this was a few years ago, and this is when, when Bruxer in 2009 had just started making crowns, and they were really kind of yucky looking. This is, 
I didn't even know what shade this is. There, there is no shade. Um, and it's like C5 or something. <laughs> but uh, he had developed a space between his molars after these were, were delivered. And the dentist just kept on grinding on the lower bridge, hoping that the, the tooth number uh, two or 15, I can't remember which one it was, would slide forward somehow. And yet that didn't happen. It stayed exactly where it was and it became a food trap. And look at the occlusion on, on, on that bridge. It was completely out of occlusion, uh, the bridge with those two new zirconia crowns. And so I wanna to talk to you about why that happened and how that can be fixed as well. Uh, this is Joe and Joe had um, some veneers done and I, I would consider those veneers to be, you know, uh, average or above average looking veneers. They're not as special as those ones I showed you earlier on Sarah. But Joe came uh, and said, you know, um, my veneer just chipped, chipped like this. And the, the dentist who did the veneer wants to charge me to patch the veneer or charge me even more to replace the veneer. And he's like, what's going on? I mean, I've only had these veneers for about a year and they broke. So what the heck happened? And these are the kind of cases that I treat all the time. Uh, patients have had these sort of situations happen to them and they want to find somebody who can figure out why it happened. Because if we can figure out why these darn things happened, then we can come up with some possible solutions to those problems. And you know that, that makes us more powerful as clinicians. And then Ali was told that this Emacs onlay would last 15 years. And that was two years ago and it was, it's already broken. You know, and what happened here? This is so frustrating when this happens. You know, you tried your best. You can, you can see that the clinician who did this, this, this DO inlay onlay thing uh, probably really worked hard on it to try to get the right blend of shade or whatever, but it failed and it failed very early. And so that's, that's not something that we want to see happen, right? We don't, <laughs> we don't want to have a three-chair practice where one chair is doing the dentistry, one chair is selling the dentistry, and one chair is repairing the dentistry. I always refer to that sort of in a derogatory way that the three-chair practice is the worst practice you can ever have. You sell it, you do it, and then you repair it. And that's kind of a miserable way to practice. I would rather have a two chair practice where I talk to my patients about the virtues of options and help educate them so we can make a decision together, right? Together, we make a decision. It's not me telling them or them telling me. We're working as team members on a treatment plan. And that happens in chair number one. And in chair number two, I deliver the dentistry and the patients are basically happy, happily uh, living thereafter. Uh, of course, that's not 100% possible, but we can at least try to work in that direction. Um, we're going to talk about ways to make indirect ceramics last longer. Um, we're going to talk about how to minimize the chance of fracture through proper preparation design. Proper preparation design. And there's a lot of nonsense out there, folks. A lot of completely unfounded recommendations right now. And it, it gets me excited and I get kind of irritated because there's a lot of things being said and a lot of it's in social media and it's completely unfounded uh, dentistry that's being pushed. Um, and we're going to talk about what does the science really tell us? And I'm going to try to provide you with extremely compelling big data type science to help you make better decisions. Um, we want to have better marginal seal, right? We want to have better marginal seal because that's going to stop the decay from getting in the bacterial leakage, right? As much as possible. And we also want to have it done in a way that it reduces staining, right? Nobody wants staining around their restorations. Not a good idea. And then we're going to talk about adjusting the occlusion. Um, this is one of the areas that I would have to say for me personally was the weakest. And I I don't know what happened to me, but in dental school, when they started talking about nathology and occlusion, we renamed that course Mythology and Illusion. It was just so distant from reality, from what we were experiencing in clinic. And our clinical faculty were not in line with those faculty members teaching nathology and occlusion. So one of the things I'm, I'm really grateful to the masters who have walked the path before me from Pete Dawson to um, Bob Lee and John Coyce and Frank Spear and 
LD Panky, all of these guys that I followed very closely over the last 35 years, um, they really paved the way for me to understand how to accommodate not only parafunction, right? Parafunction, but what about function? A lot of what you learn is about parafunctional protection, right? Anterior guidance, that's all about parafunctional protection. But what about function? How do we make sure the teeth are actually working like a machine to chew the food? How do we make sure that the teeth are behaving properly when it comes to phonetics, right? How many of you have ever had a phonetic scare, right? After you deliver something, the patient couldn't speak right anymore. Oh my gosh, I'm lisping or I'm, I'm whistling and I can't, my teeth don't seem to be making, the, I can't say the words I want to say. And you, you kind of stare in disbelief and like, oh my God, what did I do wrong? And we definitely want to make sure that everything we do allows people to enjoy speech, enjoy food, enjoy chewing, and enjoy the things that teeth allow us to have. And then um, finally, I want to talk a little bit about something that gets done very poorly in dentistry, and that's polishing ceramics. Uh, most of us have come up with ways to make crowns fit that works pretty quickly, and we deliver them, but that may not be the finest way to handle the situation. Most people, when they see what I do for polishing, they're like, oh my gosh, that's a beautiful result. But Dr. Stevenson, that must have taken you half an hour. And I'm like, no, it took me like three minutes, two minutes. Uh, they're like, what? How did you do that? And I go, well, you have to know what, what to use and what sequence. And you can end up getting results that are, I would say, equal or better than what a lab can provide for you. And so we want to talk about that. So really, when you look at it, it's about engineering and chemistry, force management, and how to deal with surfaces of teeth. And we're gonna cover all of those in pretty good depth throughout this uh, study club. So uh, I think let's get going. You know, that was a half 34 minute intro, Devin. I think it's time for us to get rolling here. We're gonna talk about part one. And in this part, we're gonna discuss ceramic materials. We're gonna discuss this concept called blocking out and we're gonna get into the preparations and we're gonna see how far we go. I think what we're probably gonna to wanna to do is um, maybe at about, uh, in about 25 minutes, we'll take, we'll take about a three minute breather and then we'll come back and we'll hit it again. And we'll stop probably about 15 or 20 minutes before the end of the seminar so that people can, uh, ask questions or, or they can, um, you know, um, render some comments, whatever. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. And I was going to mention that if you have comments out there, folks, just go ahead and put them into the chat box. I'm going to be monitoring it. And when it's appropriate, I'll, I'll let Dr. Stevenson know. And we have 99 brave souls, 100 brave souls with us tonight. I'm so happy. That's a huge turnout. Uh, and I appreciate you dedicating your evening to spending some time with me. I definitely feel uh, less lonely. <laughs> okay. Um, I need to get rid of that thing. Okay, there we go. Um, all right, so if I told you that the first all ceramic crown was on the market 133 years ago, you would probably think I was crazy. You'd say, no, Dr. Stevenson, this is not true. There's just no way. And the answer is, yes, there is. The porcelain jacket crown was invented and brought to dentistry in 1889, okay? 1889. So when we talk about, wow, we use the most modern materials at our practice, we're using this ceramic and it's just so cutting edge. And I would say not so much. We've been doing this kind of thing for a long time. The interesting factor is that it took for, this is an all ceramic materials. We're not talking about PFMs, right? but it took nearly 100 years for dentistry to improve upon the porcelain jacket crown. A hundred years until we came out with Dicor. And then finally Empress, which was a high Lucite product came out in 1998, beautiful, much stronger than the jacket crown. And we basically said goodbye to the jacket crown forever. And so jacket crowns have basically, they've been gone since 1998. If, if people are still doing full jacket crowns, 
um, they they should have probably a really good reason for doing it. It's not a typical uh, option for most dentists. And then something kind of interesting came along in, um, in uh, 1998 as well, and that was something called Empress II, uh, which was a lithium metasilicate. And I remember when this product was initially introduced, it didn't do very well. It was introduced as a core material and it, and it was kind of breaking and it was some, there were some problems with it. And Ivoclar immediately pulled it off the marketplace. And uh, you didn't hear about that product anymore. And so at that time, we were still sort of in the Empress world and trying to use that product to do a lot of things. And then in uh, 2003, uh, the, the 3M cor Corporation uh, started to use medical grade zirconia as a, as a coping. Instead of a PFM, it was a PFZ, if you will. And so they started fusing porcelain onto the zirconia and because the zirconia was a really strong opaque core, and it was better than the other products that were being used for cores like alumina and spinel and other types of these ceramic cores, this zirconia core was really kind of amazing. But the problem is the porcelain would chip off of that core. So the core would, would survive, but the porcelain would break off. Meanwhile, uh, Emacs uh, from, uh, you know, this is their product uh, from Ivo Clark, when, went back to the drawing board and they came out with a lithium disilicate and that was launched in 2005. And when lithium disilicate came on the market, it was doing better than lava because it was a monolithic material. It was, it was basically not as strong as the zirconia, but it was stronger than the porcelain on top of the zirconia, which was the case with the PFZ of the lava. Uh, so it started to take off and it was unbelievably successful, but there were still people that were very dedicated to trying to make lava work, trying to make this porcelain fuses zirconia work. And in fact, they ultimately did. Um, today, your bilayered ceramics, which we, I, we just like to call them bilayered because it's a model, it's basically a monolithic uh, coping with a layer of ceramic on top. And that ceramic is usually porcelain, but anyway, uh, these bilayered restorations are alive and well today, and they do have a really good indication, and I use them in my practice all the time for certain indications, and obviously we're going to discuss those. So um, the the lab Glidewell, uh, run by Jim Glidewell, and he, you know, and I, I don't exactly know what happened that day in 2008 or something like that, but he probably said something like this, hey guys, when these... Uh, these bilayered crowns are breaking, which part of it doesn't break? And everyone says, well, of course, Jim, it's the zirconia underneath, it never breaks. He goes, exactly. How about we make crowns out of their zirconia? And they said, you're crazy. They're gonna look terrible. No one's gonna want them. Well, everyone wanted them. People started calling it white gold, white gold. So when you didn't have room, you made a zirconia crown. Patients looked at this big bright white thing in their mouth and they said, not a problem, it's better than gold. And so this was sort of the start of Bruxer and Bruxer became so popular. It just, it's been the most uh, explosive popular item ever to hit the dental marketplace. It's unbelievable. They had no idea. And now everyone's got zirconia. And we even now have, since, since in about the last 10 years, we've been developing more translucent forms of that and prettier forms of of the zirconia. But I will tell you, this original Bruxer high strength zirconia can be made to look really pretty because we have ways of coloring it and, and they can actually look really, really nice. So that's kind of where we're at today. And I would say that the, the, rest, the, the restorative materials that we currently use in dentistry are everything from 1998 on. We still use Empress, Lava, uh, or porcelain fused zirconia. We use monolithic uh, and bilayered zirconia, bi monolithic and bilayered Emacs, and we use more translucent types. So there's a lot of materials to choose from, and it gets to be a little bit complicated. But what I'm going to do is provide you with some very clear guidelines, I hope, on how to utilize these materials in your practice. One thing we've got to be careful of is that even great companies can come up with products that don't do very well. And this is one of the products that came out that uh, I actually personally was involved in uh, early on was using this product 
and we were teaching in at UCLA at the time and for inlays and onlays, thank goodness, because for crowns, it was recommended that it not be used. And this was after many, many tens of thousands of these had been delivered to patients. Did 3M send all those dentists a check in the mail to compensate them for the loss? Did the patients get compensated? Did the labs get compensated? The answer is quite, quite frankly, the answer was no. So this is essentially a recall of a product that was developed that was recommended not to be used for crowns anymore. And that's really kind of sad. So we have to be really careful about um, just jumping on the latest thing without having a little bit uh, of, of um, research to back it up. Well, in this case, we had lots of research to back it up, but they didn't have longevity studies. And that's the problem. When you look at something that's only one or two or three years down the road in a, in a study, it's, it's pretty short. So when I look at a study like this one done by Irina Saylor and her group, and Irina is just terrific. She's a fantastic dentist. Um, she comes from the Zurich uh, program, uh, the, the aesthetic program in Zurich, and um, or Geneva, I think, I, I can't remember. But anyway, she did a, a pretty cool little uh, systematic review of the survival of crowns. And what she found on these single crowns is that the survival rate of five years for, for lithium desilicate or lucite was about 97%. That's pretty amazing. Um, even better than PFM. So those uh, faculty members that are still insisting on PFM, you have to sort of rethink perhaps your approach because the data does not support that, that thought process of using a metal ceramic restoration. Look at zirconia, how low it was compared to Emacs. What do you think that is? Well, it, it's, it's low because that was bilayered zirconia, zirconia. This study was published in 2014, right? And so the data was gathered from before Bruxer even came on the market. So that was that that zirconia that's in the study is the bilayered zirconia, okay? And that was a that was a lava type zirconia that where the porcelain was chipping off. So that's why that number was kind of a little bit on the low side. But I get excited about studies that look at this this number of things. See that right there, four thousand six hundred sixty three. And then 9,434 all ceramic crowns were evaluated. You know, that's huge, huge information and, and a really, really helpful to, to look at this kind of big data rather than very small studies. We have to look at big data. We have to stop looking at studies that look at 10 or 12 or 15 or 20 cases. Um, we have to look at big data if we really want to have confidence in deciding how to treat patients. Um, what about bridges? That's a by the way, we used to call it a bridge, and then it became a fixed process, uh, a fi fixed partial denture, FPD, and now it's an FDP. We flip those terms around now, so it's a fixed dental prosthesis tooth retained versus a fixed dental prosthesis implant retained. And so now we have more terminology to worry about, but it is now FDP for a bridge. And when you look at bridges, this study showed that that the PFMs were doing better. And I'm not at all surprised by this because the metal substructure was very strong. Uh, the zirconia was strong, but it was a little more brittle and would tend to break if it wasn't exactly the right thickness. And then, you know, and you look at glass ceramics like, like Emacs, not doing that well, not doing nearly as well as metal ceramics. So for a long time, when this study came out, we didn't have a lot of data on zirconia bridges at this time. You know, monolithic zirconia bridges were not being done in, in great numbers yet, the studies weren't available. And so at that time, uh, what we were suggesting was, if it's gonna be a single unit, do Emacs. And if it's gonna be a multiple unit, you probably ought to do a PFM. And so PFM kind of hung around a little while longer until we could work out the kinks with the zirconia. If we look at, I just mentioned it was, the, the bridge would be metal ceramic and uh, the single unit would be, would be glass ceramic, right? Um, why do I say lithium disilicate couldn't be a good idea for, for bridges? And it was studies like this that looked at 2,000 papers published between 98 and 2013, 12 articles meaning inclusion, which is not a lot, but still they looked at about 840 restorations and uh, the failures were tracked and they found that posteriors occurred more than anterior, no, no big surprise there. But the information that was sort of staggering to all of us was this, and it was that you know, these bridges are not doing well. I'm, I'm, I have to move my little, that little bar in the way it's making it so I can't see. Okay, here we go. Um, 
we were finding that the the single crowns they did great for Emacs, but when it came to bridges, not so much, folks. Those numbers are ridiculously dangerously low. Okay, so it was when this paper came out, I was like, okay, Dr. Saylor said this. This is a different paper that came out. It's saying something really even worse. I am no longer going to recommend Emacs as a bridge material. And uh, much to Iva Clark's uh, disappointment, I said, nope, I can't recommend it. I think Iva, uh, Emacs has found its place, and that's with the single unit dentistry. It's with veneers. It's with inlays and onlays. That's it. So when we look at things like bridges, we have to look at other, other areas. And at that time, we were still doing PFM. That was how we handled situations uh, in most cases, in most cases, okay? So when we look at the single crowns for Emacs, whether you put it on an implant or a natural tooth, whether you make it monolithic or you cut it back and you bilayer it with some ceramic, survival rates are absolutely acceptable, 100%. So the data all converged very conveniently and very powerfully to tell dentists at that time that if you're gonna do a bridge and you wanna make it look beautiful, it's gonna to have to be a PFM if you want it to last. And if you're okay with about a 30% failure rate at 10 years, you could do Emacs, but that's not a number most of us could, could tolerate. Let's talk about that, what these products are just a little bit so that we're really super clear on, on everything. And you know, you can classify ceramics according to you know, their microstructural basis, you know? from their glass content to their crystalline ratio. You can, you can classify them based on how they're made, right? Like um, powder liquid, or can you press the ceramic or do you have to mill the ceramic? Um, as of today, now it may change, but as of you know December 8th, 2022, the only way to make zirconia is by milling, period. Milling only. You cannot press it. You cannot powder liquid it. That's it. But with a lot of the other ceramics, they can be made powder liquid, pressed, or they can be made through a milling or grinding procedure. Okay. Essentially, I hate to say it, but it is rocks and glue. It really is. Because it's sort of a matrix of glass with particles inside of the glass. Okay. Until we get to zirconia, that analogy works really well. So if you're looking at one end of the spectrum, it's mostly the matrix. In other words, it's mostly the silica that's in between these occasional particles, and that would be your glass, okay? That would, that's basically porcelain. That's the kind of porcelain we use today for stains, glazes, denture teeth. Sometimes people have still use denture teeth made out of porcelain. And that's anytime you're doing a PFM or anytime you're doing a, a veneer that's made out of entirely out of out of feldspathic porcelain, that is, that's the powder liquid porcelain technique that most people would use. These, these porcelains can be milled, they can be milled, they can be machined, but most people use a lucite for the, for the purpose of, of these porcelains. They, 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 the high lucite is an additive, it's a crystal that grows and it makes that more uh, robust, it makes it more durable, it makes it have higher flexural strength and fracture toughness. And so these are the products that sort of are the next level, but you can understand the word glass ceramic better, right? Because porcelain is a glass. And then when you start adding particles to it or crystals grow within it, that becomes the word ceramic. So a glass ceramic is a, is a range of materials that is from the least amount to this, the highest amount of ceramic filler. And the highest amount of ceramic filler would be your Emacs product, okay? And these, these products are still around. They're, they're kind of nice. They look good. You can etch them. You can bond them. Um, you can mill them. Uh, they are great for veneers. They look really pretty. They're stronger than porcelain. But a lot of people don't think about using Empress anymore. They just go, oh, should I do a porcelain veneer or should we be doing an Emacs veneer? And I go, well, if you want it to be strong and super translucent, maybe you could also consider something in between. So this is something that would be perhaps in between for an anterior veneer case that did not have a lot of stresses involved. But, you know, people are just afraid to go there. You know, I don't want to use a product that is going to look just 1% better and yet be 10% less strong or 
30% or 50% less strong than another product. So to a certain extent, these class twos, these Lucite products are not really that popular anymore, okay? Some people will use them in their milling machines and make single units and do bonded inlays and onlays. And I think that's a great indication for them. I've done hundreds of these in the past and they generally don't uh, get used as much for veneers as they could, quite frankly. The one that everyone knows about is our good old Emacs, our lithium disilicate product. Um, the, um, the lithium disilicate is added to this alumina silicate glass. These crystals grow. They take up about 65, 65, 66% of the volume. Um, it came out at one time and then it failed and then it came out again. So it was a little, had a little bit of a black eye, but it did, it did survive and it, and it became kind of the king. So I remember from about 2006 through about maybe 2010 or so, or 11, there was about five years where Emacs was untouchable. Nobody talked about anything else. It was just the only product you could ever think of. And then the Bruxer came out in 2009 and it started to etch away at the market share. And I think now Emacs has sort of found its home into a much smaller market compared to the full ceramic restorations that we can make with zirconia. So take a look at the fracture toughness, 2.5. That's a really good number. And then we look at flexural strength of, of you know, around 400. It, and, and they'll even tell you that it's like closer to 500 sometimes. Depends on the way they test it and their statistical variance, things like that. And then, of course, now we move into the zirconias. And we have two classifications of zirconia. And it's extremely confusing, okay? But I'm going I'm to walk you through it. But the class four zirconias are your cubic zirconias. These are the zirconias that look incredibly translucent. Um, they're not as translucent as Emacs. That has been shown. Um, and they're not as strong as the densely sintered zirconia bruxer that first came out in 2009. They're not the same as the core materials that we use for bridges or that we use in implants. Uh, they're not the same product that would be used in an artificial joint, for example. These are, these are definitely a weaker form of the zirconia, okay? And they have about 50% of the volume is cubic. And we call these, we, we, call, we determine if they're cubic based zirconias or not based on the percentage of yttria that is in the uh, zirconia. So these have 4% or 5% or sometimes a little more than 5% of cubic uh, of the yttria in the zirconia. And what happens is it, it, it leaves a tetragonal form and it forms a zirconia that is partly cubic and partly tetragonal. Okay, and we'll get to that in the next slide here a little bit more. This is the one that is um, the original. This is the one where there was a video of a, of a guy hammering it into a piece of lumber. Uh, and then he did a PFM and the PFM shattered. And then the zirconia had to be pried out of the lumber with a little chisel to show you that it didn't break, not even the margins. And uh, that's pretty amazing. And this one is, is, is made up of three molar percent yttria. So the class five zirconia is the 3% yttria. The class four zirconia is the four or 5% zirconia. So you can see the numbers flip and it gets a little bit confusing at times, but just remember that the more yttria you add, the weaker the zirconia becomes, okay? So if, if your lab says, oh, we, what, what, kind of, what kind of zirconia are you using? They go, oh, we use a, you know, a really good one. And you go, no, not a good answer. I want to know what the brand is. And, and you, you've never heard of the brand before. And you say, well, can you at least tell me what the composition is? Tell me what the molar percent is of yttria. And if they'll tell you, oh, it's 5%, then you say, ah, no good. I cannot use that for tooth number 18 full crown because it's not going to be strong enough. So then you would switch over to a 3Y product. When we, is there a question? Okay. So um, I, I see a dog watching. Hi, dog. How are you? <laughs> Good to see you. Uh, that's a friend of mine there. <laughs> and um, so uh, on these zirconia restorations, um, everybody seems to be using them, and, but mainly for posterior crowns. So when you look at this study that was done by the American Dental Association about a, a little over, you know, it's almost been two years now, um, they, they, they looked at the fact that most people are just using uh, zirconia for posterior crowns. 
and a very few people are using it for anterior crowns. They're not using it for bridges all the time, only 78% of the time. That means that there's a lot of people out there that must be using this, using like PFM or gold or something. Uh, so it's, it's, it's interesting that the use of zirconia has been somewhat limited to posterior crowns. And the most common complications that are reported by this, CAD, by this, uh, this cohort of private practitioners uh, was that they debonded 52% of the time. And I'm thinking like, what? Are you kidding me? First of all, who's bonding zirconia that much uh, to report that they're debonding? I mean, most people don't bond zirconia, you cement zirconia. Um, bonding zirconia makes sense in very rare situations and mainly for onlays and things. Opposing wear? Really? Are you kidding me? There's not a single wear study that shows that zirconia causes wear to the opposing teeth more rapidly than enamel. And then fracture. Hmm. One quarter of the people report that that's a common finding. Hmm. These are interesting findings and it kind of makes you think what's going on out there. And I, I honestly, I just think that dentists kind of have this idea of this product that's very different maybe than, than what it is. If you're getting lots of fractures with zirconia, I can tell you the reason why you're getting those fractures. I can absolutely tell you that if you if your zirconia crowns are fracturing, it's got everything to do with your preparation design, everything to do with the preparation design. And we can make those corrections and we can get much better results. So, um, and look at the advantages on marginal fit was only 5%. Really? Oh my gosh, my zirconia crowns, they, they should fit like, like the perfect margin. They absolutely can be made so precisely because it just, it just it's entirely a, a, a parameter that the laboratory can set in the milling, in the milling machine. Uh, we can make these things fit to less than 40 microns, 30 microns. I mean, it's, it's very common. So I'm, I'm a little surprised that that's such a low number. But people say, yeah, the strength is really high. The disadvantage is the shade match. Um, hmm, that's interesting because... We have so many amazing penetrating stains. I'm not talking about glazes. I'm talking about special penetrating stains that go into the zirconia before it goes in the oven that can stain this and make it look more realistic. I'm shocked to see that that number is, is really that high. Uh, removal of zirconia. Oh, I love removing zirconia. Are you kidding me? That is so easy to remove. You know what I hate to remove? Bonded Emacs. That's a nightmare. Zirconia, piece of cake. So I'm surprised people think the removal is, is difficult. Anyway, so we have somehow a disconnect with the, uh, you know, the ones that, that look at zirconia all the time, that read about it, that write about it, that research it, that use it a lot, that understand the material, would not answer the survey like the American Dental Association survey dentists answered that study. It would be a very different, um, uh, you know, configuration of answers. Um, Gordon Christensen, one of our leaders in the in the dental marketplace anyway, and certainly puts out a pretty good um, little report once a month, uh, kind of looking at uh, different materials and his opinions and things like that. He's a terrific dentist. He's actually a prosthodontist. He's highly skilled as a clinician. And um, he believes that zirconia is here to stay, and it's really an amazing product, and I don't disagree with that. Um, but uh, let's take a look at in this, what well, this is called a Kaplan Meyer survival graph. And we're looking at about uh, over a thousand restorations. And when you look at tetragonal zirconia, that is the class five, right? That's the class five version of zirconia, just nothing but polycrystalline solid, densely centered, 100% survival rate at 10 years, 100% survival rate. Once they're cemented, 100% survival rate. Now, that is with preparations that are done right, <laughs> okay? So you have to understand, this is a select group. They're surveying dentists that are members of this uh, research group of Gordon Christensen, okay? So these are guys that are pretty highly trained and they're getting the feedback on how long things are lasting. If you look at cubic zirconia, we don't have a lot of time in, in service yet. We just don't really know how, how well they're working. But if we go one, two, three, four years down the road, 98% success seems pretty good so far for single units, okay? 
Uh, lithium disilicate, way up there at 94%. That's nothing new. That seems to be the number that keeps getting uh, reported over and over and over again, about 94, 95% survival rate with Emax single units over a 10-year period of time. But all of these other products, these porous infused zirconias, these Celtra duos, the polymer containing things like Enamic, and, and um, those aren't really behaving quite as nicely as the zirconias. So it's kind of good to know before we go into this. And I, what I've done here is I just made a composite chart for you. It looks super complex and everything, but it really isn't. If you look on the left, you see the polymer and it's not they're not lasting as long. If you look on the right, you're looking at longer lasting and stronger. So everything in that little, that, uh, that the triangle shape that's purple over there on the right-hand side, that is gonna represent the, the winners. Those are the three Y densely centered zirconia. So Bruxer, Zircad uh, LT, Zerlux 16, uh, Bruxer Now, Argen Z, HT, Alien Multilayer, all of these are in that 3Y zirconia grouping. And then you, when you want to get something more translucent, then you would go to the 4Y, 5Ys, which would include the Katanas and the Bruxer Aesthetics, et cetera. But you probably want to be mindful of the fact that as you go to the left, your strength uh, will decrease. okay? So maybe our length and maybe our time and service may not be as predictable. Okay. Like look at the, look at the results on the Celtra duo, 27% fracture rate in one study in one year. I mean, oh my goodness. So these are the kinds of things that kind of scare us as, as clinicians that we, we buy something, we try something new and, and uh, we get really into it. And then we find out that it really wasn't that great. And we have to give patients refunds and do a bunch of dentistry for no charge. And it's kind of frustrating. So um, let's just stick with the winners, you know what I mean? Let's just stick with the winners and let the studies guide us in our decision-making, okay? I'm gonna go a couple more slides and then we'll take a short break. Uh, zirconia can be beautiful, particularly if you know how to manage the zirconia before it goes in the oven. And I wanna, I wanna emphasize the importance of that statement. Zirconia is in a, a uncentered, chalky form when it when it is milled in most situations. We don't know, there's one product called Bruxer Now where you, we grind it after it's been sintered, but that's a very costly option because you have to buy the burr, one burr for one, one restoration and things like that. But this, this chalky substance here on the left that's sitting inside of our milling machine is, is a zirconia and it is ground on. And then before you put that in the oven and you sinter it, you can add a, a watery type stain to the surface that soaks into the zirconia deeply, deeply. So it's not a surface stain. It's not like a, like a, like a glaze or a ceramic stain. It's something that you add to the product before you put it in the oven. And these are, these are called special penetrating stains. A lot of labs don't use them. What they do is they cook the zirconia and when it comes out, They'll stain it, make it look pretty, and then stick it back in the oven and then give it to you. And you're like, wow, that's beautiful zirconia. Well, yes, but doctor, you're not getting zirconia. You're getting zirconia with a layer of glaze. And that glaze is feldspathic porcelain. It's going to wear off in a few years. It's, if, you're, if you're grinding on the occlusion, you'll notice sometimes you grind through it and you get into like this other, other material below the surface. That's the zirconia. So you have to be, you have to have that heart to heart with your lab and, and say, hey guys, come on now. I, I want to use three Y zirconia and it's got to be monolithic hundred percent. And I want you to use a surface penetrating stain so that we can get really good results. And this is, this is an example of surface penetrating stains. Um, I owned a dental laboratory for about six years with a partner. I just got out of it. Uh, very tough business. Let me tell you, uh, I wouldn't recommend it, but I loved my partner and I love I loved being part of the process. It's just really competitive dog eat dog uh, business out there for the lab technicians. And there's so few good lab technicians left, you know, it's really hard to find the good ones. But anyway, this is a bridge that we made in our lab that was done entirely with zirconia 3Y, okay? So we're talking about the densely sintered zirconia that was only stained using surface stains. So this is not, this is not a That's ceramic. Coming, Jake, he's ringing. Pardon me? Let's try and go on mute everyone if you can, please. 
What's that? Oh, someone I think came off mute, maybe by accident. Okay. All right. And then um, we love one of the things we really love about this product is that it can fit too. I mean, the the fit you can get with zirconia can be just magical. And if you're not getting the fit, if it's if it's if the margins are open or ledged, or you feel like um, the crowns are too loose, you know they flop around on your teeth too easily. And you're like, oh my gosh, I need to use a really strong cement on this one. You might want to take a look at your lab's parameters because they can mill this restoration with various different spacing between the prep and the underside, the intaglio of the restoration, right? So sometimes the um, that gap is too much. And it's so loose, it feels like you could put it on 180 degrees, the darn crown will still fit. So if, if they're making them loose like that, uh, you just have to have a nice chat with them and say, look, when you do my crowns, I would like you to use the following materials, but also let's make sure that we don't have the parameters so loose that these don't have good retention. And I think that's a really important uh, aspect of it. Um, I think right now, uh, let's take, uh, Devin, can we take about a three to four minute break? Would that be okay? Yeah. Okay, yeah, great. Thank you. So thank you. there are a couple of really good questions. I tried to um, answer them. Oop, sorry about that. Let me figure out what I'm doing here. <laughs> okay. I closed down and 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 went ahead a while a ways because I want to um, kind of move it along a little bit, and I thought it was a little little too intense in the research maybe. But the, I, what I'm going to do is uh, provide, like I said, provide everybody with a PDF of the entire presentation, which does have plenty of title slides in there that to talk about some good studies that I think would be helpful for everybody. Okay. Okay. And we're good. Yeah. Sound good. And we'll get that to Univet, and they'll they'll distribute it to everybody, so you'll have uh, something kind of nice uh, to refer back to. And um, I've I've recently worked out a course that is going to, it's already sold out, but I'm gonna I'm gonna ha I'm gonna conduct it again. It's just so cool. But the course is only uh, it starts on a Saturday at one o'clock, goes till seven p.m. We have a working dinner. And then we we see uh, we we work again in the morning the next day and finish early, and so you can get back to wherever you flew in from or drove down from or whatever at our teaching center, and we're only accepting twenty people in the class, and we sold this out pretty quickly. Um, we're really excited because this course is going to focus on extremely efficient techniques to do these procedures quickly but really well. So that's I mean that's the ultimate, not just to be fast, but to be fast and good. And um, the, the course is called Faster and Better, and it's uh, about all ceramic restorations only. We're going to focus on crowns, but it also will venture into uh, onlays uh, a little bit. But we're going we're gonna to make it so that people walk out of there and they know that they can do a, a really amazing crown prep in five minutes, in just five minutes. And so that's what you really need to be doing if you're going to be doing full mouth rehabilitations or you're going to be working in corporate dentistry and a lot of you work in corporate dentistry and it's it's pretty intense right and you know you just don't get a lot of time to get the darn stuff done so doesn't mean you have to be sloppy so we have this really cool protocol and uh that course just look for that on our website and you'll see i think we, we haven't picked a date yet for for our second course but it, it should be coming up the next uh, uh three four five months something like that i did want to share this we have a couple of questions in in the chat box. Yeah, I saw some of them. Um, I got I got a couple of them answered. But what did you have? We have um, one from uh, Milo Jin Ho. What color striped bird do you like? Yeah, I answered that. Okay, I got that one. <clears throat> um, I saw that you answered the one about the Million Center, and then contradictions to zirconia crowns, clinical differences between three versus five years, other than aesthetics. Ideal prep design with burr recommendations. All coming. Great questions. They're all coming. The answers to those questions will be will be covered. So I, I love it. So there were it seems like we're on the right track. We're going that direction. Let's take a look at this study really quickly by uh, Tasir Suleiman. Tasir is a uh, he's got a PhD. He's a, a dentist that originally was educated in Iraq. He immigrated. He went to North Carolina. Got a PhD. And he hasn't stopped running. The guy is amazing. I love this man. He's contributing tremendously to the literature base. And one of the, his his claim to fame is he looks at big data. 
So this is this is one of his first studies where he looked at 40,000 units. Now, these units were conducted by a laboratory, right? By by uh, a few different laboratories, okay? And what they did was they they looked at how many of those cases got returned for for refunds because they had guaranteed these restorations would last 5 years. And when they didn't last, they got returned. And they asked the clinician to return the ceramic with with the models to, to get the refund, okay? So that's pretty cool. You with me so far? So they looked at about 40,000 units and they found that that the single crowns were were um, were doing incredibly well. Um, the, the fractures were very low, less than 1%. Uh, fixed dental prosthesis were a little bit higher. And, but here's the interesting thing. This is very interesting. Most of them fractured during the day of delivery. Holy moly. Most of them fractured during the day of delivery. And what they found was, now, you know, you're looking at 40,000 units, right? So when you have 1% of 40,000, that's about 350, 300, 350 crowns were fractured. And what they noticed with, the, with these was preparation problems. The preps were the issue. And the, the margins were knife edge. So if, if you do a preparation for zirconia and you leave a knife edge, the, the failure rates were much higher. Now, that doesn't mean you can't do a feather edge, okay? It just means it's more susceptible to fracture. And so there are techniques that do feather edge designs, I know, and, and there are clinicians out there that swear by it, and that's great. But it doesn't always, it doesn't work, at least from a research standpoint. And don't kill the messenger. I'm just letting you know what the science is showing us, that these feather edge margins are very problematic. And you need to be careful about chamfers too, because chamfers can become too steep and they'll create a very knife edge type of effect at the edge. Because, you know, the definition of chamfer that we all think it, it is wrong. It's completely wrong. And I know that um, one of my colleagues, Dr. Mudit Yadav, is with us tonight. And Mudit, I wish you were co-presenting with me, sir. Um, you, you know this topic as well as anyone in the world about the design of margins and finish line designs. We're going to talk a little bit about it uh, shortly uh, in just a minute. So um, I did, I did want to show you that that, that particular study and, and how that one uh, really tells us that we shouldn't be doing feather edge margins. And I'm gonna skip onto um, right here because I think I wanna talk to you a little bit about how to manage the delivery of zirconia. And we do that with a technique called APC if we want to increase the retention. So let's, let's say that for some reason, we didn't get the kind of retention that we needed on the, on the preparation, it, you know, we're, most of what I do is replacement dentistry. I mean, I wish I could treat a tooth that hasn't ever had a, a restoration every once in a while, but it's like everything I'm doing, I'm taking off old stuff and I'm taking out restorations and replacing things, all kinds of stuff. That's kind of like all I do. And when you see those preparations have incredible amounts of taper, they look like a little teepee prep, it might be good to change your preparation so you can create some walls or boxes to get more resistance and retention form, but also it might be a good idea to utilize some bonding techniques. So the APC technique, the A means air braid and um, uh, air braid the surface, the P means prime, and then the, the C means use a composite cement. So if you can air braid the, the ceramic, and this is only for zirconia, okay, only zirconia, uh, if you can air braid with the ceramic, the ceramic, and then prime it with an MDP monomer, and there's so many of them out there, but Z prime is one of the, the, the greats that was invented, what, over five years ago, even was getting awards five years ago, and then follow that up with some kind of composite cement, we can, we can have a very strong, robust bond. In fact, the bond has been shown in studies to be stronger than the bond to, to traditional etchable ceramics like Emacs, which is really kind of amazing. So there are some, some frequently asked questions about zirconia that I wanted to go over with you. One of them is, does zirconia wear the opposing teeth? And the answer is no, because the grain size of zirconia is so small that we do not see wear when you polish it properly. But here's a caveat here. If the zirconia is not well polished, it works like a piece of sandpaper. It will destroy the opposing dentition absolutely destroy it. So we want to take a look at that, uh, make sure we're smooth. 
Question, what is smoother, polished zirconia or glazed zirconia? Well, it's a no-brainer. It's polished. It's much smoother than highly glazed ceramics. Highly glazed ceramics is very irregular. You look at it in the scanning electron microscope and it looks like a, a, a rocky road, you know, and it boulders everywhere compared to zirconia, which looks absolutely as smooth as a sheet of glass. So zirconia is hard like a diamond, but just like a diamond, isn't it possible to have a diamond that is incredibly smooth? And the answer is, of course, that's true. So we can have a really highly, you know, high compressive strength, very strong, very tough product, but also it can be very kind because of its high polishability. Can you sandblast? Absolutely. In fact, you need to sandblast. If you don't sandblast your zirconia, you're going to be leaving all kinds of opportunities off the table for you. You want to be able to sandblast your zirconia so you can use some kind of a bonding protocol uh, down the road. And can you bond it? Absolutely. You can bond it chemically, okay? Not micromechanically. And you can do it using the APC technique that was introduced to dentistry by Dr. Marcus Blatz. And Marcus has done a great job of, of making sure we are reminded as a profession that it is entirely possible to bond zirconia. In fact, you can even do veneers with zirconia. So zirconia is absolutely bondable, but not micromechanically. So remember that this is a chemical bond, not a micromechanical bond. So there are some take-home messages about zirconia that are really important. And then this should kind of summarize the, the important aspects of zirconia as a material. Is that, first of all, the one that came out first, the Bruxer 2000, 2009 is the longest time in service. And it does not wear opposing teeth. It's an amazing product and you can make it look a lot prettier today than you could in the past. Number two, I would avoid ceramic polymers for full coverage molar crowns. If you wanna use these enamics and um, the other Celtra duos or other types of things that are glass ceramics that are weaker or ceramic polymers, sure, but probably more for onlays, inlays, things like that. I think that would be probably a safer uh, indication for them. As far as um, zirconia failures, the ones that is fail the highest are the ones that have feather edge margins and have been under reduced occlusally, under reduced occlusally. So under reduction and uh, feather edge margins or thin preparations are not a good idea for the 4Y and 5Y types of zirconia. They're not a good idea for the 3Y either. The glaze is going to wear off. So if you go down the road about seven years or so, only 10% of your glaze is still going to be there. So the key, with, the key with zirconia is to have a really high polish. You know, polish these darn things as high as you possibly can, and you have done a great service for your patients. As far as I'm concerned, if the prep is nice, right, if, if we follow the rules of the prep, and we're going to get into preps in a minute, or in a, maybe in a few minutes, but when we get into preps, the, if you prepped it right, you can use a glass ionomer or cement. There's no reason for you to bond, okay? There's no reason to make your life complicated. You don't have to do it. I feel bad for the people who think that everything must be bonded. I feel really sad that that's the path they've chosen because it's, it's going to be riddled with all kinds of complications and problems. I mean, just isolation alone to do bonded ceramics is really tricky. So I would recommend that whenever possible, just use a resin modified glass ionomer or maybe one of the uh, self-adhesive resin cements that we have available to us. And we're going to get into cements in greater detail in the... Um, in the, next, uh, in the next portion of this uh, study club that we have. Um, and that's basically it. Uh, I think that whenever you are gonna be bonding ceramic, it's a really great idea to consider the rubber dam. Uh, I'm a huge proponent of the rubber dam. I uh, threw it away after I graduated from dental school, okay? I threw it all away. I didn't want anything to do with it. And about a year later, I saw a lecture from a clinician that was using rubber dam and I said, hmm, maybe I should reconsider. And about a year after that, I started bringing it back into my practice and I haven't left it since. So rubber dam has been a part of my clinical practice for 34 years. I love rubber dam. I use it continuously for everything and even surgery. I will lay flaps, place rubber dam and perform root uh, debridement for periodontal cases. 
and it's 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 a fantastic augmentation to the practice. My patients love it too. I, I don't know why people are so resistant to rubber dam. Anyway, so the next big topic is about blocking out to conserve two structure. And and I, I think most people do this nowadays, but I did I did want to just make sure they were on the same page that uh, block out is something that is not a buildup, okay? It's not something that is done to increase the resistance and retention form of the restoration. It's done to conserve two structure. It's done to make a clean preparation. So when you look at this, this little, I did this little drawing here and put it up on the slide, right? So when you look on the left, that little drawing there, and you see that gray area at the bottom, that's the remaining block out after you've removed the carries uh, and you blocked it out and you cut your ideal preparation. Look how, more, how much more narrow your prep can be if you use that block out there as your starting point. So I, I disassemble all the old restorative material, right? I take out all the carries and all the DJ has to be squeaky clean. And then I'm going to utilize a, a probably some kind of a liner or whatever. But on top of that, I'm going to have this blockout material that I'll fill up to full contour. And then I will prepare my tooth, leaving the blockout as a dentin replacement. That's the key, a dentin replacement. It cannot be an enamel replacement. Blockout is just for dentin. There is one situation where you can actually have a margin on the blockout material, and that's called deep margin elevation techniques, which are very rare. I run into deep margin elevation techniques, probably one out of 200 crown preps. It's not something so, super common, but people like to talk about it a lot because it's kind of cool. But we can talk about deep margin elevation down the road a little bit if you really want to. But primarily, I like to place my restorations on two structure whenever possible, where that would be the most conservative overall approach to that particular patient, considering periodontal surgery, bone levels, et cetera. But blocking out is the first thing we do. So let's just show you how we do it. So here's an amalgam. Uh, it's going to be removed. And the amalgam is, is removed completely. And all the caries is removed and everything else. And then we can take a low viscosity liner like a Fuji, uh, this Fuji Lining LC product right here. Um, and then we can lay that over the surface like here that. So here we are. We're laying in that little liner and we're spreading it around. And it's getting into all the little uh, hard to reach areas, which, which is so nice, right? Because if you try to use a viscous product and put it in there, it doesn't always flow that well. Uh, so we use this little glass onomer. We like cure it. And then after that, we would use uh, a material that would have a, a harder surface, something that would be more machinable. You know what I mean by that? Machinable. It, you can prep it and it preps like two structure. So we use a more filled, uh, res, uh, you know, basically this is a resin modified glass onomer. Now, alternatively, if you don't like glass onomers, no problem. Then just use your, use your composite, use a flowable composite or some kind of a buildup composite, like, like a paracore or a Luxa, Luxacore or any of those core type things that are at Bis, Bisco has, duo cores or whatever it's called. So all of these things can be used at, instead of the glass onomers if you want. I'm just showing you here in this situation um, using glass onomers. And so then we have, we have this amalgam that now looks like a temporary, right? And you know, it's kind of cool. And I do this a lot for big cases. I will disassemble all the teeth I can in one visit and block them all out like this and let the patient go like this on their first visit. I now can refine my treatment plan because I know which tooth is going to need a crown, which tooth can be an inlay, which tooth can be an onlay, which tooth cannot be saved and maybe should be extracted. So it's basically, I'm, I'm using this as, as a way to create a dynamic diagnosis for the final treatment of the patient. And now we can refine the estimate for the patient. Maybe there's a fee decrease, maybe there's a fee increase. So it's kind of a cool way to handle rehab cases uh, in a way that doesn't, doesn't make it one tooth deliver, one tooth deliver, one tooth deliver, or just commit every single tooth to a crown. You can disassemble and evaluate what the most conservative prep might be. In this series, I'm using a burr called a KS1. KS1. The KS1 
has a slightly rounded end and it's parallel sided. So when you make your preparation for an inlay, you need to tip the burr. You cannot rely on the inherent taper of the burr to create the draw that you need to have for an inlay preparation. I was always taught by my mentors, complete the occlusal before you drop your box. And I resisted that advice for the longest time, but I got to tell you, it is amazing advice. If you can just do the occlusal to the best of your ability, you can't do it any better. And then you drop your box. So we drop our box as a secondary step. So first thing, get the occlusal done. And now we drop our box. And you can see in this particular example where the block out is serving as a dentin replacement. Okay. A dentin replacement. Okay. So the amalgam was large. The final preparation for the ceramic is almost the same size. How could that be? Knowing very well that that amalgam was convergent. Well, the way we were able to get away with that was using the block out technique. So I think that this is a really valuable uh, procedure to do. If you wanted to charge in your practice a disassembly fee, I know I have a friend of mine in Newport Beach. He charges, he charges his patients for blockouts. I don't. I personally don't charge for a blockout. I also, you will, unless I'm doing a post, I don't charge for buildup either. I don't. I incorporate the all those fees just sort of get thrown into the crown fee. So I never worry about getting paid from insurance companies for buildups because I never charge for buildups. I never charge for blockouts. People say, oh, well, Dr. Stevenson, that's crazy. You're missing out on this huge fortune of, of reimbursements. And I'm like, uh, I don't think so because my crown fee is pretty high. You know, So I kind of compensate for it that way. I just tell the patients, look, there's no charge today. I just cleaned out all your teeth. And they, oh, what if he never comes back? Well, if he never comes back, he's... That's his problem, not mine. I'm not going to worry about it. You know what I mean? It, life is too short. Just, just move on. Patients, trust me. By the time we, we put a bird to a patient in our practice, that patient wants to stay with us for life already because they know what's happening in their mouth. They understand it. It's all about education. You know, we're not prepping teeth and having people run away and never coming back. I mean, that's just uh, something that happens through developing a relationship with your patients and keeping them with the practice. You know, this is another um, block out example, a bunch of amalgams that were um, kind of ugly looking, but um, went ahead and disassembled utilizing um, um, a 330 diamond burr and getting them to this ugly state. We all look at this sort of stuff and, you know, do you sometimes wonder what to do next sometimes? Um, if you say no, I always know what to do next. I'm like, okay, wow, that's pretty special for you. <laughs> I don't always know what to do next. Sometimes it's a tricky decision to, to know whether to leave the black or not, or take it away. You have to, you have to check it out carefully with the, with your spoon and your explorer and decide at some point, I think I need to leave this black stuff. However, if that black stain is at the DEJ, I better take it out. You know what I mean? I, I'm going to, I'm going to keep making my prep a little bit wider until I remove all the black and the stain that's at the DEJ, because that's a very susceptible area. That's an area where I need to have really good clean tooth structure. So we're going to take it from here to here. Do you see the difference from here to here? So we're going to we're going to take out that black stain from the DEJ, but we're going to leave it in the deeper areas, and then we're going to bond and do our blockouts. So when you look at a case like this, you go, "Wow, I think all of those probably could just be composites. <laughs> they don't even need to be ceramics, you know, unless there was some compelling reason." Uh, what am I doing indirect ceramics here for? Uh, these all could be composite restorations. If I have the time and the patience to do them, uh, we could do this as composites. But um, in this particular example, I'm just showing you that we did buildups, uh, blockouts, and then immediately prep the teeth for, for inlays and onlays. Utilizing the burr by tipping it at an angle. Uh, this burr has a uh, taper to it. And the burr I'm using here is called an 847. 016, 847016. It's a tapered, flat ended, slightly rounded on the corners. And it's a great burr to get your prep started pretty quickly. So, boom, do all the occlusals, right? 
So I didn't even worry about all that excess composite and approximately. I didn't even use a matrix in this case, just laid that laid it in there. And then you can then take this uh, burr, this 847KR for all of those occlusal areas. And then you can use a smaller burr. And I like this one here called the 8850-012-014 to, uh, and this happens to have a red stripe on it. You could use a, a, a you know, one with a green stripe or whatever, uh, or a black stripe or no stripe. It depends on how you want to handle it. I just like thin, fine burrs for interproximals because I'm usually removing mostly block out and just refining walls. Does that make sense? So I kind of I don't I don't like the idea of putting a lot of coarse burrs interproximally on inlays because then I have a lot of cleanup to do and a lot of refining. And, and inlays are tricky because you don't want to hit the adjacent tooth. And so I like when I go in between the teeth, I like to have a bird that's pretty skinny, like this 88501014. And then you can use a, a refined version of the 847 called the 8847 uh, KR016. And the KR burr is different than the one that doesn't have the word KR because the KR, I think, is some German acronym for rounded corner. Okay. So that's how I remember it anyway. K would be corner and R would be rounded. And for me, it just it's just an easy way to remember because if you get the one without the KR, the edges on it are kind of sharp and it probably is not a good idea to use that for inlay preparations. And so then we can start to sort of uh, then drop the boxes and, and get past the block out onto enamel. We had to do a little cusp removal there on the distal lingual, but you can see that the preparations could be kept pretty conservative, all things considered, okay? So there are some principles to practice when it comes to selecting ceramics that we should talk about. Uh, and there are seven things and that I wanna go over pretty quickly here. And the first one is space for structure. We need to think about second molars that have maybe less than 1.5 millimeters of space. You really gotta go with, if, you, if your patients are absolutely freaked out by the idea of gold, you got to go with zirconia. It's got to be monolithic, period. Um, most patients, it's fascinating. Most patients that I've talked to on second molars will, will tell you that they will be okay with gold. Isn't that interesting? But if you, if, if, if they know that you can, you can have a stronger restoration, less chance of breakage, less removal of two structure. If they hear that, they go, Hmm, so basically I'm giving up a little bit of aesthetics when I, when I lift my mouth wide open and sing so people can see my second molars, but I'm getting something that's gonna last a lot longer. You know what? Give me gold, give me gold. And I've, I've, my mind has been blown. I've had some very uh, aesthetically conscious patients that will say, no, 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 I want gold on my second molars. So don't throw that out because it is a definite possibility. I know it's expensive because gold is outrageously expensive, but it, it's a really cool service you can do for your patients. Okay. Um, if, you need, if you need bonding due to lower tension, you're probably better off long-term considering a glass ceramic versus a zirconia. Although Marcus Blatz would argue, though, that's not true. You can absolutely make zirconia bond with the same bond strengths as you can with glass ceramic. The problem is we just don't have the same data. You know, when you look at the studies over time, you just don't have as many compelling studies to prove that zirconia with bonded uh, technology is going to last as long as ceramic. So I'll leave that up to you. You know, if, if you're into the zirconia world and you want to stay away from glass ceramic and you want the strongest possible thing and you want to bond it, use the APC technique of Blatt's and rock and roll, and you should probably have, I would imagine, very, very good success. We just don't have the same quality of research to say that zirconia bonded is better than glass ceramic bonded over a long period of time. Unfortunately, that data does not exist, but it's, it's a clinical decision. If you need maximum translucency and the stump shade of the tooth is light, right? Glass ceramic is amazing. It's beautiful. It's translucent. It's more translucent than the most translucent zirconia, period. There is no study that shows that there's any type of zirconia that's more translucent than a glass ceramic. So they're coming close, but still not enough. If you need to block out a tooth that's got a dark stump shade, 
like, you know, that black tooth, you take off that old PFM and it's black underneath there. And you're like, oh my gosh, what do I do now? I want to use, I want to use Emacs. Well, you can't use Emacs in a situation like that. Although Emacs has really opaque cores you can do. If you're really committed to Emacs, you could, but those opaque cores are not as opaque as zirconia. So what I would do in that situation is I would, I would just use a monolithic uh, or zirconia or a layered zirconia that's cut back and layered to match like a veneer. For example, okay, tooth number eight, tooth number nine. Tooth number eight needs a veneer. Tooth number nine needs an old PFM removed, okay? So you take off the old PFM and the tooth is black. And tooth number eight needs a veneer. What do you do? How do you make the match? Well, the first thing you got to do is you got to block out the dark tooth, right? So by utilizing an opaque zirconia core, you can block out the dark tooth and then you can layer that zirconia with a feldspathic porcelain that can be made to match the feldspathic porcelain on the adjacent tooth. Not an easy case to do, but a great way to approach that particular situation. When it comes to high functional risk, in other words, Bruxers, everybody should be, that's a Bruxer should be, we should be treating these patients with ways to protect their teeth, right? I mean, either these patients have horrible sleep problems, right? Bruxism is, is a common finding in sleep disorder breathing, but we also have Bruxism issues with patients that don't have breathing problems. And we have we have bruxism during the daytime, right? Daytime bruxism. We have habits and parafunction. So I think that in those situations, zirconia is going to do a lot better. The research pans out. This is what it's telling us. And it makes a lot of sense to go with zirconia in these cases. When it comes to inlays, onlays, and veneers, my go-to material is a glass ceramic. However, with veneers, I really need a lot of convincing to go with Emacs over Feldspathic. If my patient is doesn't have parafunctional habits. Um, they're basically a vertical chewer and they don't have a lot of wear on their teeth. I love porcelain. I love regular old glass type one, class one porcelain for veneers because it can be made so beautifully. And they'll make it on platinum, platinum dyes usually. And uh, it can be made to fit really well. It's elegant. It's a beautiful way to approach it. Uh, definitely not as strong as Emacs, but I would say probably can be made usually more translucent and more beautiful. Zirconia uh, 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 Emacs requires a significant amount of cutting back and layering to make it look as pretty and takes a very skillful technician to do that. Uh, zirconia, I'm not ready yet. Um, there, are, there, there are a group of dentists out there that love zirconia for veneers. I'm not there yet. Um, I suppose if I have a, a heavy duty Bruxer that does not need a crown, but needs something more than just a, a, a filling, then maybe a, a zirconia veneer can work in those situations. And then definitely for fixed dental prosthesis, I think we've learned the hard way. Zirconia is the way to go. Okay. I talked about stump shades and you got to get this little sucker is the coolest little stump shade guide there is. It's made by Avoclar. It's called the Natural Dye Stump you know, uh, uh, Shade Guide. And you can use this little thing to communicate to your technician exactly the color of the tooth underneath. And so they can communicate this in a way that allows them to use the ceramics to the best of their ability. There are some situations where I am so unsure what ceramic to use. And that's right. Dr. Stevenson is very unsure. Okay. It happens to me a lot. And I, I seek opinions from others, laboratory clinician, technicians, other clinicians. I bounce it off my friends. I talk to my associates and I, and we get, we kind of, it gets our juices flowing and we come up with some better ideas. One thing you can do is you can prep your patient and take a, take a shade like I have here in the upper right with all of these different shades here and send that photo to your technician and say, this is what I got. What do you think? And they can give you some advice about what kind of approach you might want to take on that particular patient. Okay, it's a great one to have. So let's talk a little bit about inlays. And I think what we'll do is we'll get we'll go a little further, maybe another like let's just do like four more minutes, and then we'll leave about ten minutes for Q and A. But inlays, I got I gotta be honest, I don't think inlays have a have a huge uh, place in in our in our practice because. 
composite is, is so good. You know, you can do a beautiful direct composite. So why do you want to charge a patient four times as much to do an inlay when you can do a really nice composite? Well, there are some situations where it makes sense. Like what if, what if the, what if it's too difficult to make a composite? If I did a survey right now, how many of you love doing class two composites? I bet nobody will raise your hand. We all admit class two composites are hard. They are brutal and they're, they're hard to do well. And uh, we know they don't last as long. So maybe there are those occasions where utilizing an inlay makes a lot of sense, but you got to have enamel, got to be, the tooth should be vital. It should be able to heal itself, right? Um, you should be able to isolate this. And, and I love the material lithium desilicate. I think it's it's really the ultimate material for this. It's super strong. They look good. And I make them in my office. You know, I can do it on my uh, on my milling machine here in my practice. And then, of course, you have to adhesively cement these. These can never be cemented with a regular cement. I've heard people say, oh, you can use a self-etching cement like Unisem 2, and you can use that. Uh, no, you can't. Not according to the research. Study shown that that technique is not a predictable technique. You've got to treat these like a veneer. You've got to etch them, bond them, go through the whole process just like you would uh, a veneer. And this is just an algorithm that I know I saw. Um, the, Dr. Rodriguez gave this uh, table clinic last year in Chicago, and I said I love your table clinic. It's super cool. It's all about a decision tree and when to go direct versus indirect. And I think it's pretty cool because it, what it, what this does is it tells you, you know, take out everything first, right? First you disassemble and then you decide, oh, if the isthmus is really wide, then we better go to an indirect. If it's, if it's less than, than one third of the intercostal space would be less than two millimeters, right? Because intercostal space on average is six millimeters. So if it's three millimeters or wider, we should probably do indirect. If it's three millimeters or less, we can do direct, okay? That's pretty cool. Um, what about the proximal box? Um, if the proximal box doesn't need to maybe break the contact by very much, we probably should do a direct restoration. But if we're breaking the contact by a large amount, you know, it's, it's much more difficult to create contours on composites. And then if the pulpal depth is shallow versus deep, if it's already deep, you've already got the room for ceramics, it makes sense to do a ceramic in that situation. Inlays have got to be done with smooth tapered walls. They've got a real well-defined margins, rounded internal line angles. They've got to basically look like an amalgam with rounded line angles, but divergent. You don't, you don't want to make this look like a gold inlay. It shouldn't have sharp internal line angles. It should be smooth and rounded. It should be thick. It should be flowing. It should be done so that you know exactly how deep you are in the middle. And one of the best ways I've found to do this is by using a depth cutting burr like a 330 burr and go to the full depth of that burr across the block out, right? Across the block out. And then you've got yourself a guaranteed proper depth and you're not gonna have too thin of an inlay. It's very common for people to prep inlays with not enough depth. And the burr that we were talking about earlier, the 847, 8847, they're perfect for this. These are some inlays that were done uh, by a clinician at UCLA. I think that uh, they're not mine, but I think that they satisfy the requirements. Um, this was just a, a quick average day in a practice. Uh, these were not being done with knowing that I was going to uh, uh, look at these images. I just uh, bopped into the room and said, let me get my camera. And I took a photo and irritated the doctor uh, tremendously. Uh, she didn't want me doing that, but I took the picture anyway. And you can see that the thickness was 1.5 to 2, rounded internal line angles, flowing outline forms exit angles approaching 91 to 110 degrees, smooth tapered walls. You know, that was pretty cool. This, this was a decent approach at doing ceramic inlays. And, and uh, I can see flaws everywhere, right? That's what I do. I look for little flaws. I'm just like I do in my own preps. And we can all see problems here and there, wiggly walls or this or that. We don't like that much, but you know what? This is really good dentistry that was done very conscientiously with a doctor. You actually using a rubber dam to prep the teeth. Pretty cool. Um, here were the restorations before the cement was cleaned up and they looked beautiful, beautiful restorations all done with Emacs glass ceramic. Um, let me skip on to onlays. And I think what we'll do is I'm gonna stop at onlays and um, kind of open it up for Q&A at this point. 
and uh, let's see where that takes us. Does that sound pretty good to everybody? So, um, Devin, if you can take a look at the chat interface, um, I will as well. And I will um, definitely try to answer any questions that anybody has at, at this juncture for our first day. I appreciate the any questions we get from out in the field there. Here we go. You know, one, yeah, uh, yeah, I'll read this one. Well, thank you for your, your nice comments. I really appreciate it. Okay, let me try this one. How is IvoClean different from Z Prime? What a great question, doctor. IvoClean is a zirconia based scrub. It is something that is high pH. So it's going to have a pH that's around 12. It's 12 or 13. It's really caustic. It's kind of like like lye or bleach. It's really, really tough. So it's very high alkaline. And what it does is it removes all the salivary glycoproteins. It removes all of the debris that's inside of the restoration. So, so this IvoClean is a product you would want to use on a, usually on a glass ceramic to clean the surface before you start to consider um, cementation. IvoClean can be used before you etch. It can be used after you etch. It can be used after you silinate even. So IvoClean, just think of IvoClean as like a scrub. It's just basically like a soap to clean things. And it has no relationship to bonding. Z Prime, on the other hand, is a, a very well-crafted synthesized molecule that will connect to the oxygen that's in the zirconia. So it, it bonds to the zirconia chemically on one side and on the other side, it has a long chain um, uh, carbon chain that will then bond to the composite. So it's an actual linkage. Z prime is a linkage molecule. Ivoclean is just simply a scrub. Does that make sense? You never wanna put Ivoclean on the tooth. Ivoclean is really bad for patients in their mouth. You only scrub it in your hands and run it over the sink. Um, when it comes to when I would use full crowns over onlays, I actually have an algorithm for that that we will cover in the next session. But I will say this, um, onlay is arguably, and Mudit, you're here with me, and Dr. Skoulis, you're here with me too. You're a faculty at UCLA and moved at your faculty at, uh, at UC San Francisco. You guys feel free to chime in. But basically, I would consider the onlay is to be dentistry's finest posterior restoration. It owns the crown for being the best because it supports the occlusion. It, it reinforces the tooth. It saves tooth structure. Um, it it it's just a marvelous restoration. The problem with onlays is they don't deal with deep cracks that are that are forming along lingual cusp along the gum line. They're they're not great to use when a tooth is missing a lot of tooth structure. There's not a lot to bond to. So in my in my practice, onlay is always what I'm thinking to do first. That's my first choice. And if I can't make an onlay work, then I can then I can very carefully extend the margins more gingerly to turn it into something that's going to contain the tooth, right? So it doesn't even have to be a crown. It can be something between a crown and an onlay. You can call it a cronlay because it's not really a crown. Think of it as a super gingival crown, and it's still kind of an onlay, isn't it? So it usually has to do with uh, what quality those remaining walls have. Okay, how good is the quality and what is happening with the internal? Okay, we are going to talk about polishing zirconia, Susan. Um, I recommend a kit, uh, the one I use, I mean, there's many of them out there, whether it's uh, Axis or you go to uh, Brassler or another company like um, um, Comet or Meisinger, what, any of those companies, they all make wonderful uh, polishing sequences for zirconia, but you have to use the sequence that they give you. I personally like using the Brasser system, and I'm going to share with you exactly how I do it, the sequence, the shapes, everything in our upcoming lectures. So I'll share with you more, but as a preview, I would check out the system by Brasser called ZR. It's called the ZR uh, Dialyte Finishing System. ZR Dialyte, D I A L I T E. Um, and it uses just two steps. It's, 
it's amazing uh, how, what you can do with just two abrasives. Okay. Um, thank you, Moody, for agreeing with me. <laughs> I always like it when people agree with me. Uh, some doctors think a crown is not a good restoration. Others are totally, uh, and others are totally are against it. What is your thought in about two words? Um, too opinionated. <laughs> I think that dentistry is a wonderful evolving uh, profession where we have very complex algorithms that can be utilized to make decisions about crowns versus onlays versus whatever. And I worry about dogma. I think that it's important to keep an open mind and always be searching for the best way to handle any situation. Having said that, though, I think we need to rest on very firm fundamentals. Um, if crowns are done elegantly well, but they were done for the wrong reason, that's going to fail. If you did a perfect crown on a tooth that didn't need a crown, that's a shameful thing to do. If you did a perfect onlay on a tooth that needed a crown, that's also going to fail. So it's it's too difficult for me to, to say that there's only one way to do something. I think there's many ways to do things, kind of like what I was saying at the beginning. I appreciate, though, I, I love controversy. Um, composite onlays, I think, um, and this is from Milad, I think composite onlays are, uh, direct composite onlays are phenomenal. I use them all the time. I have a YouTube video on a direct MOD composite onlay that I did. Uh, I have uh, used these techniques for patients that don't have the finances to do more extensive dentistry. So for example, you could perform a root canal procedure on a tooth and save the tooth, but the patient says, oh, I can't get the root canal because I can't afford the crown and you might as well just take the tooth out. Wouldn't it be nice to do the root canal and then provide that patient with something that was durable and could last that patient maybe four, five, six years, something like that, until they get into a different place and maybe they could get a crown done. So those are procedures that, that we do here. I treat all kinds of patients. I treat the, the patients that have a B after their name, you know, with all the zeros. And I treat patients that are, are making minimum wage. And we have to provide our patients, I think, with an entry point into what we have to offer. Does that make sense? Provide your patients with an entry point into your practice because you care about them and providing them with the best treatment that they can afford. The best treatment that they can afford. And I guess one of the problems I have with dental schools is, and I was a dental school person, for, for 26 years is that, you know, we're very dogmatic. And it's like, if a patient doesn't say yes to a treatment plan, we, we tell the patient they're dismissed and we don't treat that patient. But wouldn't it be nice to bring them into your practice and provide them something in between? I think compo composite onlays are excellent options for patients. Okay, I think um, we're out of time, Dev. I wanna keep on time. Anything you wanna say before we wrap up other than when the next, uh, our next session is going to be. Devin, I think you're frozen. Maybe Devin's not able to reconnect. Um, let me just say, while De Devin, are you there? Yeah, I'm back, I guess. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, uh, this last question here is about prepping number 18 and 31. Okay. Never seem like I have enough occlusal clearance and I tend, unless I overreduce and you don't, you avoid the post. Oh my gosh. I love that question. Can we save that question for next time? Because there's a, there's so, that question requires a very well thought out answer. And I think we're kind of out of time to do it, but uh, trust me, I will approach it for sure. And I'll talk about also, uh, Jason, about your, um, the best cement for uh, strength and easy cleanup. It's coming. It's coming, but I'm going to have you come back. Does that sound okay? Because I don't want to keep it going too long. I just wanted to remind everyone to make sure you take the evaluation survey to make sure you get your CEs and give us some feedback. So please make sure you do that. Great. Okay, everyone. I'm going to see you on January 19th, 6 o'clock Pacific time for part two of this. And uh, we'll pick up from where we left off here on ceramic onlays. And it was great to spend some time with you all. And thank you for staying up late, you guys on the East Coast. And we'll catch you in 2023. Be healthy, be well. And maybe see some of you in Chicago.
That would be amazing. Yeah. Okay. See you at AOG.